Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Clinic Gym Radio. I am your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and it is my pleasure today to be joined by Dr. Tara Guru. Tara, did I say that correctly, number one? <laughs> uh, pretty close, Giroux. <laughs> oh, Giroux. All right. Well, all right. <laughs> one of those cool French names that has an X, but, you know, it's I don't know if that's silent or it's a, it's <laughs> not supposed to sound like an X. So uh, it definitely has some cool flair to it. So oh, thank you. Tara, you are uh, based here in Las Vegas at the UFC Performance Institute. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. So I've been down here now working at the Performance Institute for a little over a year. Um, it is a 30,000 square foot state of the art performance center where we have pillars of sports medicine, strength and conditioning, sports science, and nutrition components to us. Um, We have a team of, I believe, like 13 of us who are there based out of our headquarters, um, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five, which can, you know, can be a lot longer than that, of course, but um, that's kind of our home base. Uh, We also travel to the UFC events, which are put on weekly. So we kind of rotate between um, a team member from the sports medicine staff and the nutrition staff to help to kind of just make sure that we go smoothly for the athletes. Um, We're there to support them on sports medicine and nutrition based to make sure that they can get to that fight healthy. Um, And then as far as being in, you know, at the UFC headquarters in Las Vegas, we have um, obviously local athletes who live here in Las Vegas, who train here, call us our home base. Um, And those are kind of like our regulars that we do do see very often. Um, but because our roster is 600 global athletes, we have constantly have an influx of athletes coming in and out from all over the world. They might stop in, um, for a day, they might come in for three days for a week for, you know, an eight week long rehab stint post surgical. Oh, so nice. we have communication kind of all over the world in a so sense. What, what's that. the criteria for them to be covered under your care? They just have already fought under UFC or they're scheduled to. Yeah, so as long as they are on the UFC roster, they have access to us. So we uh, at the Performance Institute, we only see the athletes. We don't see private clients. Well, I mean, on the side we can, but we really only cater to the athletes at the Performance Institute. So as long as they're active on the roster, um, they can come and go as they please. And what's amazing about what they've done with this place is that everything's free to the athletes. So when they walk in the door, every single service that they get is Mm -hmm. completely free. They don't have to pay for anything. So they don't have to pay for, you know, sports medicine, chiropractic, physical therapy services. They don't have to pay for food, nutrition. We have a cafeteria on campus that they can get free food for. We have a partnership with Thorne Nutrition that they get all of their supplements, which are NSF certified for free. Um, We have obviously loads of recovery tools for them to utilize. Like a, we have a hot tub, a cold plunge. We have an underwater treadmill. We have a sauna, a steam room, a cryotherapy tank. We really have an incredible facility for these athletes to come in and utilize. So yeah, I've, I've been in Vegas for 13, almost 14 years. And when I first moved here, my, uh, one of my college roommates was actually on the first season of the ultimate fighter. Really? <laughs> so he introduced me to all these guys at UFC and this is early days. So, um, he had this, this guy surfing his couch because this guy was so broke that couldn't, uh, the guy couldn't afford to pay him rent. Uh, that guy's name was Forrest Griffin, by the way. Yeah. Uh, my boss. <laughs> yeah, nice. And he surfed my buddy Alex's couch for a long time. Um, and for a while I was doing, I was trying to help out and uh, I was treating a few of them, but you know, the problem was they're all broke. I mean, they're, they're all living the glory life of it's, it's no different than like minor league baseball where, right. you know, until you get that major, major contract, you know, you can't necessarily afford four times a week, three times a week, one time a month for God's sakes, because they're living hand to mouth. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then the other thing, I don't know how you handle this and what you guys have learned, but man, that was like, I remember telling one guy, uh, all right, you know, we're working on your shoulder. Like, you, you got to take some rest time. He's like, yeah, I'll just wrestle and do jujitsu tonight. I won't box. And I'm like, right. <laughs> okay. And then what about tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow I'll go full go. I'm like, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> yes. And that's something that we 
deal with every single day, monitoring training loads. And that's where what's really cool is we can pull in our sports scientist who is um, really proficient using Omega Wave, which is kind of like a readiness um, wearable technology, which we can track. And so it gives the athletes that feedback too. So really at the core of what we're doing, yes, we're you know, we're supporting all of these athletes, but what we're, what we're really doing in the behind the scenes stuff is collecting data on these athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, so MMA as a sport, I think has been around only around, you know, 25, 26 years, the UFC has been really up and running. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it that way and you compare it to football or MLB, that's maybe been around for a hundred and 150 years, we don't have that sport science and that data collection yet for this sport. Um, so that's a lot of what we're trying to do. So every time that they come in, they're getting tested, they're getting constant feedback, constant, you know, progressions, constant like communication with our entire staff based on data and based on analysis and sports science, which is just so phenomenal because like you said, these athletes, you know, some of them are world champs and in the top five or the top 10 and are making pretty good money. But at the end of the day, these athletes are all independent contractors. So Mm -hmm. they, they can only make money if they fight. And they're only fighting, you know, if they're healthy, maybe three or four times a year. I think the record right. five a year, five fights a year. Um, and but you know, let's say you get one fight and you get hurt and you're out for a year, uh-huh. like that's that's a lot of cash flow you're not getting in from fighting. Sure. So what's really wonderful is they built this facility that's you know a la carte for these athletes. So I think it really is phenomenal for those you know those rookie athletes and the rookie fighters who are coming in and you know they're only making maybe. 10k a fight or something like that and you know which that's got to last them like you're saying for 10k they win on one night which is awesome but that's their that's their next six months of paycheck right like well yes but you have to take that 10k but then you have to pay your coaches you have to get taxes taken out you have to pay your you know your your team and all these funds you know, they might be walking away with like a couple grand at the end of Mm -hmm. that. So their livelihood is fighting. So it's amazing that they can come here and get the care that they need. Um, And, you know, maybe if they're even not here, we do a lot of remote programming for them. You know, we can send them nutrition. We can send them. um, We, we also have a partnership with trifecta, which is like a organic meal prep company, which is phenomenal. We can, we send them meals, we send them thorn supplements, we can send them SNC remote programming, um, PT remote programming. So, we're really trying to reach all of these athletes and have an impact on a really long lasting career for them. That's awesome. So I don't think anybody listening would ever say like what you just described is not, I mean, this is a world-class program, right? I mean, it's the all encompassing umbrella that covers all aspects. Um, and, and, you know, it sounds, I could take out the words UFC and I could add in like LA Dodgers or sure. Atlanta Falcons, and it's going to be very similar Um, Mm -hmm. but let me ask you this. So you worked at a sports chiropractor office before this, right? And with Jim Kurtz, who what's up, Jim, I hope you listen to this and (laughs) I hope you're doing well. Um, (laughs) he's up in Seattle, but it's still, that was still a, I don't know what you want to say, a community-based kind of chiropractic clinic that, that catered towards athletes. Right. But nothing like what you're doing now. Right. I mean, Correct. Obviously, it, it is a little different. Um, Jim didn't not, have a, a million bucks to throw into equipment to just, you know, fill up the corners. Right? Oh, <laughs> like, if he wanted to, though, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but yeah, I was in private practice for, you know, the first five years out of school. And okay. my passion has always been sports medicine. And I yeah. really, I knew how I wanted to practice. I just had to find you know, the right clinic, the right mentor to do that. And, you know, luckily by a lot of luck and a lot of hard work ended up in great clinics, um, you know, like Jim's clinic. And we did have a multidisciplinary clinic there. You know, we have, um, you know, Dr. His wife, Dr. Sue Brown is there. She's an acupuncturist. We had athletic trainers there. Um, we had, we didn't have a massage therapy at the time in clinic that I was there, but I know they had them in the past. So mm-hmm. it was multidisciplinary and we got to, um, you know, branch out because of Jim's network was so awesome. So I was able to take advantage of, you know, shadowing orthopedic surgeons in the area and things like that. So it set me up really well to get to this position that I'm in now being able to communicate with different professions. And I mm-hmm. think that's just so important if you want to be in, 
you know, working in a sports performance on a sports performance team in this kind of setting. So, so let's start there because my original question that I, I want to ask you so much is when you made that transition from, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the uh, community based to the world-class facility. And there's somebody out there listening. I know that's like, that's what I want to do. I want to work in professional sports. I'll, you know, I'll stay up late. I'll come early. I'll clean the tables. But what is the skill set, number one, that mm-hmm. you think we should focus on that maybe isn't talked about a lot? Like, for example, I personally think uh, sports science, for example, if I think in a few years, 10 to 15 years, it will not be odd for a patient to come in. Hell, it might be less than that, but uh, go, hey, um, you know, I had this, uh, I have my HRV data and I would like you to take a look at it, right? And it's, yeah. it's like they walked in with their x-rays or MRIs. You don't have to be able to do it, but you have to be able to look at it and have a basic understanding. And this is what that is. This is what that is. Yes. You know, 3D data is becoming a whole lot easier. Force plates or, or pressure mats like the body track and swing catalyst. And, you know, all these, there's all these facilities now and so many communities that produce data. But we as a practice or as a profession had better get on that train and learn how to at least interpret it yeah. in the future. Um, I'm asking a very long question here, but let's start there. What, what skills do you think, uh, everybody who wants to go into professional sports should maybe take a look at if they're not already considering it? I love this question. I love talking about this question. Um, I feel like I took a very, that's why I invited you on. (laughs) I feel like I took a very unique pathway that a lot of, um, you know, my fellow peers in my profession and in my Cairo class did. Um, so, um, you know, there's this thing going around now, like, uh, you know, there's a great book by, um, Epstein called range, right. About being a generalist or a specialist, right. Obviously I am a specialist for my profession as for as part, or I guess as a sports chiropractor, but within that, I feel like I'm a generalist at a lot of different things. Like I have a lot of different tools in my toolbox that I can utilize because not one person is going to come in and respond to that one thing that you can do. So I think you really need to have like a broad range of knowledge in a couple different aspects. You don't have to be amazing at one thing or all of the things, but I think you definitely need to know, and then you need to just own that. So um, I think one of the most important parts, and I, I guess a big way on how we treat on my sports medicine staff at the PI, it, we're very manual based. We're, we're one-on-one. We have a luxury to spend a lot of time with these athletes, which is amazing. I know that's not always the case in private practice, but um, you know, we spend an hour with each patient and we are doing hands-on pretty much the whole time. So I would say like my number one tool that I would utilize in these appointments are soft tissue therapies. So I've obviously taken a ton of courses um, and, you know, you don't have to be amazing, like I said, at every one, but you definitely need to be effective in a way. So figure out whatever jives with you. If it's grass in, if it's ART, if it's fascial manipulation, if it's dry needling, if you can, you know, make all of those courses happen for yourself and get a little bit of everything and blend them. That's what I tend to do because I just feel, you know, just with years and years of practice and working on people, you just find you know, dry needling works really good for this person or, you know, massage works for this person, deep tissue works for this person. So you just have to have a plethora of tools in your toolbox. And I know that's kind of like a common thing people says, but it, people say, but it really is true. I would, I would say, um, so manual but, therapy is a huge what I, component. Yep. What, you, what I'm hearing there is you have to have one of those skill sets or, or you have to have a soft tissue skill set and probably a osseous adjusting skill set, but the brand of it doesn't necessarily matter as long as you're good enough to bring it to the table. Yeah, absolutely. And as long as you are effective with it and you know, and you can recognize like when it's not working or when it is working for that. But I'm going to guess you didn't get your job based (laughs) upon whether or not you had completed this brand of training, but it certainly was nice to have that on your resume. Yeah, certainly nice to have that stuff on my resume. Um, I think obviously being a really good adjuster is an awesome tool to have. Um, 
So I think it's really special. I'm, I'm the only chiropractor on the staff of the UFC. So I also have a physical therapist and athletic trainer with me. Um, and I just think that that was something they were really needing. And, you know, that was a big part of, I think, maybe why that they wanted to bring a chiro on. Um, and it's just so powerful. It really is. It's um, the athletes love it, <laughs> especially MMA athletes. You know, they like the aggressive rack and crack. But um, I think combining those two are wonderful. But if you're going to work in sports performance, you have to know, you know, sports rehab. You have to know functional rehab. You have to know how to do progressions and regressions. You have to know how to and when to, you know, plug those in. You have to know how to uh, communicate with S and Cs and their coaches to make sure. For those that who don't know. They, Strength and conditioning or the Sorry. strength coach, right? Uh, the strength and conditioning. So we have three strength and conditioning um, uh, guys on our staff who uh, run programs for the athletes that are there. Yeah. And then we also have their MMA coaches that we're working sure. with. So more but basically you need to be able to get them from the table, yep. either from the, your table into the octagon or from your table into the uh, strength and conditioning center. Yep. Basically as fast as humanly possible. As fast as humanly possible, because yes, exactly. But like I said, like for this sport specifically, like, you know, if they take time off, they don't get paid. It's not like they can sit out and they mm-hmm. get, in, you know, they have an injured reserve and they're still getting sure. paid and not working on stuff. So, uh, but, you know, obviously the luxury we have is that sometimes we're, you know, we're seeing them two, three times a day, every single day. And it seems, it might seem like a lot. And obviously that's a luxury that we have because we don't deal for insurance, but like, what I've just found with this is like, they're responding so much quicker than you could possibly imagine. It's, it's incredible. It's going from maybe two or three times a week in private practice to maybe five or six sessions or 10 sessions sometimes a week. And like, and more if you would stay there on the weekends, right? They'd be like, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there's been, you know, when you work in sports, there's not really like a set time. So there's definitely been times where I've been there till midnight and there's been times I've worked till two 30 in the morning on the road. And yeah. there's been lots of Saturdays and Sundays and um, you just make it work. You, you get them to that fight, you get them to whatever their goal is. Um, and you know, it's obviously they're athletes, so they're going to respond a little, little bit better than the lay population. But you know, you just plug away until you fix, find the way to fix them. (laughs) So let me Uh, ask you this. I mean, you travel sometimes, not to every event, but you travel, what, at least once a month to an event? It's been about once a month. Yeah. Maybe once every six weeks, something. So regularly you travel and Mm -hmm. you're ringside to offer care or backstage to offer care, whatever it may, case may be. Then you Mm -hmm. have people that are in the performance institute for injury and then I'm going to guess you also have a bunch of people who are there for the performance side. Hey, I don't have an injury. I just want to get better and better and better. Yep. And what percent of your, um, if we look at your year's work in the last year, what percent was sideline or whatever you say ringside? What percent was um, injury, truly injury rehab? I'll include surgical rehab in there. And what percent was performance care? Oh, good question. Um, I would say, so as far as the travel goes, we have, uh, you know, the three of us on the sports medicine staff that will rotate to events. So I probably went to, I think, six or seven events um, in like the first, I mean, like probably nine months or something like that. But then we have, we, we really try to go to almost every weekend. So I think we went to like 25 out of 40 events last year, wow. which is a pretty good. And then our goal for this year, you know, being, of course, being sidelined by Corona, we, we wanted to get eventually to every single event. You're going to get um, to this, uh, what a battleship that Dana White's bought by or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I sure hope so. That'd be, that would <laughs> suck. <laughs> um, yeah. So travel wise, I mean, I say probably like maybe 20%. Um, and then injury working on th- things post-surgical maybe 50 and then the rest maybe 30 percent like maintenance care um Mm -hmm. just you know as they just want to come in after training you know get a flush get work done feel Mm -hmm. good rest recovery things like that so it it definitely depends like if they're not injured the athletes still like coming in they still like hanging out getting work done making sure they feel good they're recovering well because you know their training load is insane these athletes training load are they're working out maybe four or five sessions a day 
So they're getting up in the morning. Maybe they're going for like a run or a bike ride on their own. They're coming in, they're doing their strength and conditioning session. They're going to spar. They're going to wrestle. They're going to jujitsu. Uh, they're going to regular MMA. They're going to whatever it is that they're doing. And when they're in camp, they're doing four or five sessions a day. So honestly, even just coming into PT to recover and, and just, you know, get a massage or whatever it is, use our Norma Tech is amazing for them to have. So my, my buddy used to say like, how he's like a half of the benefit of massage, I think is being just in a dark, quiet room with, you know, music playing on in the background with a warm cover on you. He's like, if I can just do that for a half an hour, it's about half as good as the massage, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I think that that just is so beneficial. I mean, obviously, like we teach them self-recovery methods. We want them to be proactive in their prehab, so to speak, and, you know, do the things for themselves. Sure. But obviously we have, they have us to be utilized. They have all of our, you know, fun tricks and um, tools that they have in the PI that they can utilize. Um so when you're saying in the PI, the, the PI is the Performance Institute. The, sorry, yes, yeah. the PI is the Performance Institute. Um, so yeah, they, you know, they use like, utilize the cold plunge, the hot tub, the sauna, things like that to recover. Um, so yeah, it's, it's awesome. really awesome for the athletes. I think it's really special what we're doing here. So for a young doctor out there, what's, uh, you know, I mean, like if you're in, in school, you'll hear about the MPI adjusting and the Gonset adjusting and the ART courses and the DNS courses and you know, FRC and all these things, but what's a skill that uh, doesn't get talked about or a, a coursework that doesn't get talked about that you are like, man, I'm glad to, I, I've, I'm glad I learned this or you didn't even know about it till the PT or athletic trainer introduced you to it or um, sports science or anything. Is there anything that you were just completely unprepared for that you're like, oh, wow, like I didn't realize what a big deal this would be? Um. Probably like what I've learned a lot from my coworkers right now is like, w like wound care, like oh, which interesting. Is really cool, really out there. Um, yeah. Obviously like, you know, nothing out of like my scope, but like we have, you know, in the wrestling MMA world, like there's tons of, you know, infect skin infections. We deal with staff, we deal with ringworm, we deal with all of these really fun things. You know, they're getting cut constantly. We have to do, you know, stitches, we have to do, um, you know, series strips of wounds, things like that. Like that's been super interesting, you know, cause it's not really something that I've learned necessarily in, you know, um, chiropractic school or anything like yeah. that. But I love watching like our athletic trainer and have him have, he's taught me so much on that stuff, which has been awesome. And then I think just like one of the biggest and coolest things I've really seen is so my two, um, kind of two teammates who are on my sports medicine staff, they both worked at the USOC, the United States Olympic Committee Training Center in Colorado Springs for um, probably five or six years. I think they worked there and just what they have brought in and how they handle like post-surgical cases has been really mind blowing for me. You know, they are basically like, we're, you know, we're really aggressive, I would say, as far as, you know, the lay population mm -hmm. goes. So it's been really interesting to see how, you know, how quickly they push, how they, you know, they're cleaning or, you know, if we have, let's say what we like to do, because I think, you know, obviously we're pretty good at it is if we can get that athlete in post-surgical um, day two, like we're immediately starting with pain and inflammation control and we're cleaning the wound and we're making sure like, you know, mentally they're feeling good and they have nutrition pulled in with them and they're on anti-inflammatory supplements and, um, we we're pulling in sports psych and we're pulling in S and C because if it's their knee, they can still do an upper body workout. So it's this been, been this amazing blend of how interdisciplinary can affect like post-surgical recovery and like just being so aggressive, um, with their, you know, surgery and, and pushing them to get range of motion as quick as they can and, you know, get up on their feet and, and weight bear as soon as they can. And, you know, we're pushing them to do maybe two or three sessions a day with this and the wow. recovery and the timing that I'm seeing is, is blowing me away. It's really making me question, you know, like, which would just kind of the general, you know, don't, don't walk on this for three weeks. You have to use crutches. Don't move it. Like, don't touch it. Like all these different things, and all of these different opinions from, you know, orthopedic, orthopedic surgeons and their mm -hmm. docs and their PTs and things like that. And 
um, just comparing it to the way that we're doing it is, is super interesting. And the results we're getting is, is in- phenomenal. Like literally pushing the limits of pushing the limit, but like we have not had, and, but I mean, knowing your limit, right. So obviously like they've been doing this. And these are also, miles. you're starting with the a very, very healthy, very, very conditioned, very flexible, yep. good muscle tone, good muscle mass, like good bone density, like every marker would be near the top, right? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, they're elite athletes, which makes the process definitely a lot easier right. as far as, you know, obviously they're athletic and they're relatively healthy. And yeah. I mean, if my father-in-law at age 72 has a hip replacement, I don't think you're going to get three sessions. I mean, even if I shoved him into your you know facility, he's just not, he doesn't have the same baseline these guys, these guys have, you know? Yeah, very true. But you know, in that sense too, is like, you know, they're at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's all body. Like, why can't, why can't you push it within their own limit? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely very interesting kind of what I've been learning there and how different that's been from private practice and the fact that you can only, you know, maybe get people in two, three times a week. And I know that's hard. And, you know, for me, just racking my brain about how can I, how can I get this out? How can I, kind of help blend this into private practice how you know what do you what is you know our my co-worker my sorry my you know fellow peers how how can they do this um kind of method within working with insurance companies and stuff like that it, it's definitely something I'm trying to figure out how to help with <laughs> yeah I mean it's if you solve that girl, you you got the keys to the universe, you know, yeah. but, but it, I mean, in your point, like I have a friend who's a PT in a hospital here locally. And he said when he first got his job 15 years ago, um, hip replacement would be like uh, recover for 48 hours, bedridden for 48 hours. And then, uh, and then you'd get them up and get them walking. And, you know, I can't remember what they had to do. They had to one lap around the nurse's station for discharge. No, they had to be able to stand for 20 seconds unassisted for discharge. And he said, now, like when they wake up out of uh, anesthesia, we want them to get up. He's like, we don't even put in a um, catheter anymore. We want them to use the bathroom. And he's like, that's what they're going to do when they get home. So the only limit, he's like, if I could get them standing while they're still knocked out from anesthesia, I'd do it. But I just, you know, I just can't. And he said, and now it's, it's like two laps around the nurse's station for discharge, which he said, if he would have brought that idea up 15 years ago, they've been like, you are out of your mind if you think that's going to happen. And he said- it's still 80 year olds. It's still 75 year olds that are doing this. And, and, you know, again, if, if you would have brought that up years ago, then been like, you're crazy. You're, you're a man, man, you know? And he's like, yeah. heck no, they're going home. They're going to, you think like they're not going to get up on their own at home. Like, right. you know, so I think you, you guys are onto something there and it's, it's exciting to think about how much you're able to, you know, I'm constantly amazed by the resiliency of the human body in many ways and how yeah. fast it can heal. Um, you know, I mean, back in the day, uh, you know, women were knocked out for childbirth, you know, and it was thought of, oh, we got to do this surgically, basically. And, you know, my wife delivered our last baby at home in a water bath. And it, it was a thousand times better than our hospital based birth, a thousand okay. times, maybe more. I mean, it was just a night, night and day difference. But we all had the intent of this is going to go well. And if it doesn't, we have like, you know, we can all like you're saying, we pushed it within the limits. Yes. We're not going to do that at ri- a home birth for at risk populations or right. if there are other markers that say, don't do that. So luckily we got away with a very easy birth and healthy kid. Awesome. Anyways, probably people yeah. listening going, this guy's a total <laughs> hippie, but it was, it was totally worth it. It was amazing. So. No, I love that. Um, yeah. So, t- yeah. so I'm sure that listeners are going, all right, she's been around these crazy UFC people for a while. Uh, I'm sure they want to hear a story. So are there any good stories you have of, of UFC athletes, uh, positive or, or funny or um, unbelievable that, that you're allowed to share? <laughs> oh, man. Um. <laughs> I'll share one about your boss that I was around for. That was <laughs> I probably got some for him, too. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so he's on, they're on the first season of The Ultimate Fighter, you know, and he, I don't know if you remember, he went up against Stefan Bonner in the yeah. final bout, and they both won a contract after that. And... I don't know Forrest that well. I just knew him a couple times hanging out with my friend, Alex. But uh, he is one of the toughest humans walking the face of the earth. I mean, you could run him over with your truck 
And I don't know if that will do anything to him other than piss him off, you know, like, yes. And certainly when he was younger and hungry for that contract, he was like that. Um, so he's tough. And he, like you said, I was remembering this when you said wound care at some point in his training, he got this big, I think it just started out as like a pimple or something on his back. But after the constant grinding on the back and the sweat and everything, it broke open at some point, then it got infected and everything. So I think he's like, I don't know if it was the Stefan Bonner fight or what, but he's, they have a fight on the show or something. So he's like, Oh, he's telling my friend, you got to take care of this. So Alex is basically treating it like you would a pimple and trying to squeeze everything out of it. Yeah. <laughs> like we got to keep it from getting infected. <laughs> so he's sitting in the bathroom, this crappy like two bedroom apartment and Forrest is bent forward in his fight trunks in a bathtub and one dude squeezing it and the other one's dousing it with bleach in an attempt to get this like skin infection to go away. I'm like, there are third world countries that have better health care than what's going on right now in this bathroom, you know? And then, you know, years later, he was the, the hero of the UFC. So it was just a funny thing to see this, like, it looked like a bullet wound. And I think, I bet if you still, if you asked him to look, it's, if I remember right, it's between his spine and his right scapula, I bet there's what looks like a bullet wound in his back from that thing. It was so gnarly. So, uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Oh um, <laughs> man, he had. I've seen some gnarly staph infections that. Ugh, I don't even know how you. I don't know how a lot of times these guys let them get that big. Um, but that's definitely definitely an issue. Um, so I, I'll say c- kind of something that's more just kind of fun. Um, so in January, we had the Cowboy versus Connor fight card. Mm-hmm. And Connor came out a couple weeks early for that. And he's rolling deep with his crew of maybe 20, 30 people because that's just what he does. Um, so so anyways, a light day for his crew. Yeah, light day. <laughs> so uh, I think my boss was working on him and kind of joking around. And he was just like, man, I need some I need some music in here. Like, I don't know. Like, I mean, like, this is cool, but I need like my need like my home music and I think we were joking around and it's just like we were like well why don't you just like fly in your favorite DJ and like totally just messing around joking laughing literally the next day like one of the most famous DJs from Ireland was upstairs had the turntables going blasting music I was just like this is just ridiculous and then the next morning you pull up and you have cowboys like RV tanker trucks you know like just all of his toys like parked out front and we're like okay well we know we're cowboys here we know we know connor's here it's just it's it's fun like honestly like i love working with these athletes they're i think uh getting the kick the shit kicked out of you for a living makes you pretty humble um yeah. so they're honestly they're, they're really cool they're really grateful for being there um we we have a lot of fun um and these guys are just they're, they're grateful for what we do for them and it's a great relationship and they've taught us so much. It's about resilience and grind and dedication. And, you know, they're amazing athletes to work with. They're some of the probably most athletic athletes in my opinion in the, in the whole world. So it's, it's been just super, super fun to learn from them. That's awesome. That's yeah. incredible. That's incredible. What's one, one of your more rewarding times? Like, uh, I mean, here you are, you've had this lifelong dream of being in sports. Yep. Have you brought anybody back from, you know, the, uh, what, anybody would have termed a season or a career ender or, you know, had a a time that you stayed up all night with an athlete or something where uh, you hang that little feather in your cap to say like, this is the reason I did this job. Like, this is the reason I moved. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you took a lot of jobs where you didn't make as much as other people would have demanded, but you're like, this is for the, you know, greater good. Do you have a, a success story? Yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you one that's not necessarily like, oh, I adjusted this person and it, and it solved the world. So um, I'm going to tell you one from being on the road, because I think that's kind of fun. So when we travel, um, basically what we do is, the, you know, the fights are always on Saturday. So we get in Monday and kind of just like get everything ready. And then Tuesday morning, we start check-ins for the week. Um, so check-ins basically is where kind of like they come in, they get, um, you know, their fight outfit for the week. They get all of their media schedules. They sign their posters. They check in with us. So I kind of do that like Tuesday um, during the day from like nine to four or five or so. And then we start treating and kind of scheduling appointments Tuesday night. 
so I work all Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, kind of Friday and Saturday up until the fight, basically when I'm on the road. But um, I had this case back in October. I was in Boston for a fight and um, had a guy come in and he was like, hey, can you take a look at my foot? I cut it on the cage um, a couple weeks ago and it just hasn't been healing and it hasn't and it's still open and it's, you know, it's really bad. It's and basically he had probably a he had a really deep incision between his like pinky toe and his, you know, fourth digit there or whatever. And it was just sliced. And when you go to check in before your fight, they check you to make sure that it's safe for you to fight, that you don't have like any like open wounds that might get worse, that might cause issues that might get infected, things like that. So this is a big, this is a big deal. Like this needs to be. This dude's supposed to fight in three days, four days, days, four days. Right. And basically what he had done was, I think it had happened like two or three weeks before this fight. And he, you know, was trying to like mend it himself with like, I don't know, super glue or something. And I think he went into the hospital and they were like, we can't close it up. You know, we can't stitch it. It's not going to, It's not going to close because of the location of where it's at. Um, But every time he walked or kicked or pivoted on it, you know, it would basically open back up. So what I did basically was try to manage this the best that I could with what I had. So we obviously have a med kit um, that we bring with us and we have, you know, different cleaning agents and wound care, things like that, that we can help with. So I think I basically saw this athlete at least two or three times a day for those like four days and just like hammered it with, you know, antibiotic cream, um, Duraderm, steri stripped it, taped it, cleaned it, like did everything I can to kind of duct tape, zip ties, bailing wire, whatever the hell you could use. Whatever I could find. Right. Um, and surely like day by day, just like it kept getting better, kept getting better, kept getting better. And he was able to actually like jump on it, walk on it, pivot on it without having pain. And it closed enough to the point where the commission thought that it it was going to be fine for him to fight. So things like that, where you don't realize that you need all of these different tools because, you know, it's not something you can just adjust or, you know, massage around. Like you need to be able to manage these things when you're on the road and you're dealing with, you know, athletes who have cuts and infections and things like that. So that was really cool for me because that was just something that was so out of like the script and out of like what I had, you know, done in private practice and stuff like that. And to see that just be effective and for him to be so grateful and he like, texted me after the fight and he had ended up winning the fight. It was just, it was a really cool thing. So that'll be stuck in my mind as far as that, something like that goes. That's awesome. That's a great story. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean that, that little tiny, you know, whatever it was an inch long cut, like that could have cost yeah. him that fight, which would yeah. have thought it was, you know, negatively affected his career probably. So. Well, yeah. And not only that, but when you don't feel a hundred percent going into a fight like that really affects you mentally. So the fact that he just felt so much more comfortable with how it felt and the pain and, you know, the fact that he could go in and, you know, not think about that and just focus on what was in front of him was I think the best thing for him. So. Are you looking to get into the tennis crowd locally? then I would highly recommend you check out RacketFit.com. Now, RacketFit is designed by the same crew that brought us TPI, Tidal's Performance Institute, but it's designed around the game of tennis. Now, if you know anything about tennis, you know that it is a fantastic pool of patience because typically tennis players can pay cash and they can come in for performance care. It's everything that you want in a patient. They show up to appointments, they're easy to deal with, and they've got money. So highly recommend you check out RacketFit.com so that you can serve those tennis players better. It's all about the assessment of uh, tennis and the moves that the players have to make, and I can't recommend it enough. So check out RacketFit.com. Last question I want to ask you. So uh, you are a female in a male-dominated sport that's starting to break out. So there's some female fighters. Um, Mm -hmm. But what tips do you have for for our female listeners that want to get into that male-dominated thing? Because, you know, you – you haven't once mentioned anything about unfairness or anything like that, which is awesome. And you seem like you, uh, whatever accolades you have, you certainly worked your ass off for. So congratulations. But what tips do you have for them? Oh, that's a really, that's a really great question. And that's something that definitely hits home. Um, 
I feel like there's been a lot of jobs that I didn't get because I was a female. Um, even if my resume was badass or, you know, I had all of the desirements, I still remember a couple phone interviews years ago that they were just kind of like, like scoffed at me, like in, in a way and, you know, didn't get called back, even though I knew I was qualified for the position. So um, it's a thing. It's definitely a thing still. And I would just say like for the ladies, like you, like we have it, we have it harder. We do. We, especially if you want to work in a male dominated sports, a sport team, like the MMA and, you know, or UFC or whatever it is. So um, honestly, first thing you need to do is just, you need to be confident. You need to be able to communicate really well. You, you have to have the knowledge. You have to be, you know, you have to be strong too. You have to, be not, you know, physically and mentally, I think, because you are going to get some hits and you're going to get some looks and you're going to like, there's been so many times where patients were like, are you, you know, I'm only five, two, I'm a small little thing, but you know, I can adjust Francis Naganu just perfectly fine. Um, and so cool. I mean, I've got, yeah, I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten looks that have been like, you know, like, are you, I've gotten comments, like, are you sure you can adjust me? Are yeah. you sure, you know, you can handle this, like all this stuff. And like, you just got to shake it off for what it is and make a joke of it or, you know, whatever it is, or assure them whatever your style is. But like, you got to put in that work to be there at the end of the day. Like, so if you're going to, if you're going to get 20% less, you're saying be 120% is good. Yeah. And then it'll be the same. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have a little bit of a disadvantage, but like at the end of the day, you have to be really, really confident. Like if you're going to work in sports, like no sports, like don't just like want to work in sports. Like I have, a, I mean, I've been an athlete my entire life. I can walk the walk and talk the talk and you need to be able to do that. So if you want to work in football, like you better start going to games and, you know, knowing lingo and getting yourself out there and talking to these docs and going to shadow and going to ask them if you can shadow. And I think one of, okay. So every single job that I had gotten in like private practice, I basically had reached out to them. I didn't wait around for, you know, an opportunity or a posting to come up or whatever it was, I pretty much set my resume. I did my research. I figured out what I wanted. I figured out who I wanted to learn from and mm -hmm. I reached out to them. And it was amazing the response that you got from that. You know, a lot of, a lot of docs are perfectly, you know, comfortable with you coming in and shadowing and they want to help and they want to reach out and, you know, in, a, in the community, like, you know, like you've created and, you know, FTCA and stuff like that. Like, I think, people don't ask for help as much as they should or could. I think it, whether it's a, you know, an ego thing or being uncomfortable by doing that, like you're never going to get what you want unless you ask. So if you want to go and shadow, you know, if you want to come to the UFC PI and shadow, reach out. If you want to come and go, you know, work with Jim, he's always, you know, able, you can always go and shadow him. So figure out what you want to do and how you want to practice and go figure out and talk to those people who are already doing it. Right. And, you know, get their recommendations and like bother them and get on calls with them and ask if you can shadow multiple times and then just follow up with them. If you really want to work with them, like multiple emails, like quarterly, whatever it is. And, um, get out of your comfort zone because honestly, a lot of people will just, stay where they are and wait for an opportunity to come to them. But I had moved from Michigan to Florida, to North Carolina, to Seattle, to Vegas, and basically did it because I knew that the opportunity was going to be good for me. So I had to put, push myself out of my comfort zone and make those sacrifices and invest in myself. And, you know, I'll say firsthand, like, you know, I wasn't making a lot of money in my first couple of years in practice, but I sacrificed that to get to where I am now. And I invested in myself and all that spare change I had, I put towards continuing education courses and I put towards seminars and trips to shadow people and, you know, going to conferences and learning all of these things because I feel like that's how this paid off for me. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, and it's easier said than done. Obviously there's circumstances, there's families, there's funds and stuff like that, but try your best to invest in yourself and go for what you want because it will pay off. 
in some aspect, but you got to keep trying and keep fighting to get there. That's awesome. I love hearing that. I mean, I think it's really appropriate right now because there's so many people who are, I talk to clients every week and I'm sad, I'm disappointed, I'm angry that we hear these people that like are laying down in response to this, this virus. And it's like, do you got to fight for this stuff? Like it's not, nobody's going to give it to you. So if somebody wants to reach out and, and, uh, and chat with you about their future or they want to come visit, uh, how can they get a hold of you by the way? We're not ending this. I just want to make sure you get your info out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I appreciate everyone who's taught me and I really love to teach too. And we have a really kind of open door policy on coming to shadow and stuff like that. So if you want to come spend a day at the Performance Institute, you are more than welcome. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. Tara, D-R-T-E-R-A. Um, or For those you- listening, Tara is spelled T-E-R-A. <laughs> Yep. Feel free to shoot me a message on there, or you can email me at T Giroux, G I R O U X at UFC.com. Awesome. So let me ask you this. Uh, so you are essentially in your dream job, right? Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> and, and how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? 31. All right. So you're 31 years old. You're in your dream job. You've, you just said you've gone from Florida to Seattle, to North Carolina, to Vegas, to everywhere else. Along that path, if you were to name one person, and we go back as far as you want to first grade, I don't care, but one person who you think opened up more doors or opened your mind or was like the ultimate person you want to say thanks to, to get you to this perfect ultra dream job you're in now, who would it be? Oh, man. <laughs> would it be so those listening today? can't see you biting your nails but you know <laughs> I know I asked a heavy duty question but uh I'm sure there are many people along the way that that oh, either helped you get up that me. ladder or pushed you or pissed you off enough that you were motivated to get up I mean yeah my wife will tell you she's a DAC bar and she tells me the the number one person that got her through was her instructor that told her her first year it's a three-year program you bet you may as well quit now you're never going to be able to do this and yeah. she was like well, if there's one thing I must now do before I die, it is prove you wrong. Yeah. And so, and you know, can I, can I list like a couple, like, like two or three? Um, <laughs> so looking back on it now, honestly, I think I would probably have to say probably, probably the way that my path kind of changed more into this sports medicine direction. It was my clinical direct, uh, clinical director in, in Cairo school. So Dr. Maria Young, um, and Dr. Tom Young, her husband, um, where was this in Palmer, Florida. Okay. So that's where I went to school. Um, so she, I, I kind of landed in her, um, you know, like cohort kind of randomly. She wasn't necessarily my first choice, <laughs> but ended up being, and you know, and then that's how it goes. Right. Like, you know, she, and she introduced me to like SFMA and McKenzie and Stu McGill and ART and, and being in that cohort with like-minded you know, individuals who wanted to learn those things too. Like, you know, I had an athletic trainer to learn and, you know, to learn from, and I had people who did this seminar or this seminar and it was so cool. And it just introduced me to so many different things. Um, and then I guess I would say in like private practice, um, you know, I had such a great experience up in Seattle at Jim and Ming Ming's place. And they were just, so welcoming. And it was finally like the practice style that I really wanted to, um, to practice like, and, you know, they, they're just the kindest humans and the best providers possible out there. And I think that obviously with both of their backgrounds and, you know, Jim being in professional sports, he was able to, you know, mentor me and, and help me. And I was able to really understand what it took to get to where I am. Um, what's that junior football team that he works with? I can't remember what they're called. Uh, um, JV little tiny, not tiny that Seahawks. good football team. Yeah. Oh, the Seahawks. Sorry. Oh, the Seahawks. Yeah. <laughs> they're all right. <laughs> yeah, they're okay. Um, no, but, uh, so, so Jim, uh, Maria Young, these people sure. all helped you get your. Yeah. But, and you know, just like, gosh, there's so many, I just, and I'm going to, say something that's might seem like ignorant, but I'm going to say like myself too, because I wouldn't, 
be where I am today if I didn't like trust in myself and push myself to get out of my comfort zone and go do all of these things and to just like push and to continue to learn and stuff like that. So, you know, I, the, me doing all that led me to meeting so many awesome people at different seminars and different conferences, you know, like, um, Uh, Tara, I'll tell you this, like I, I say this and if it pisses people off, uh, (laughs) good. I hope that gives you the fuel to, to fight for what you truly believe that you're worth. But I've been a part of many conferences where we were actively trying and we requested to get women up on stage. The number one request every time was we want more women up on stage. But when we approached women and we said, we sent emails or called people, we, this one conference, we asked 10 women specifically go up on stage. Like we would love to have you present about what you're and all but one said, no, I don't really have anything to talk about. (laughs) Like, yeah. Okay. Then don't ever complain that there wasn't an opportunity. You know, it's like, it's being handed to you on a silver platter here and you're still saying no. Exactly. So the fact that you're saying you got to believe in yourself, you do. And it's scary. It's, it's scary as hell to get up on that stage, especially if it's your first time or whatever. But there are so many people that say, Hey, there, you know, X doesn't exist. And it's like, like what I'm hearing in your story is this didn't exist. There was no chiropractor at the UFC PI. There wasn't even a UFC PI to, you had no pathway other than to say like, I'm going to create it out of the pieces that I already have. Nobody yeah. was already doing it. And if you think back to our profession or any profession, Clarence Gonstead, there was nobody showing Gonstead technique. He didn't have clubs, you know, when the SFMA was invented, nobody was showing them how to do exam. They had to kind of hack it out of what they realized didn't work. Yeah. And yet they still did it, you know, and they put it together and the UFC itself was built on. I mean, it's the ultimate uh, merit based sport in the fact of like, you think you think Taekwondo is better than Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Cool. Hop in the ring. Here's mm-hmm. the deal. You got five minutes to prove it. There'll be a one minute break. And then there's another five minutes to prove it. Yep. And you'll know, we'll know by, by the end, which one's better. And it was like very quickly showed us what techniques were really good for that and what didn't. And that's how it got its name, mixed martial arts, right? It's not, there's, it's not a single one. Yeah. And so you basically took an MMA approach to your career and, and had the confidence to say, like, I'm going to fight for this. Like, you know, it yeah. might be outmatched, but damn it, I'm not going to stop moving <laughs> forward, you know? Yeah. And honestly, like MMA was never on my radar. Like I am a, I'm from Detroit. I'm a hockey girl. I'm a baseball girl. I'm a, you know, I went to Michigan state. I'm a football fan. Like you found I found the only thought, sport other than hot. Literally the they're only allowed to hit each other I more did. than hockey. Right. <laughs> yeah. Literally the only sport I had honestly never really watched. And then you know, obviously landed this job and it's just been like, this is the coolest thing I'm learning. And I love sports. So I'm learning a new sport, you know, and I get to work with these amazing athletes. I get to travel, but you're right. I'm, I'm a female in a male dominated sport and there are not enough females that are speaking up and being confident and going to play with the boys. And that's just something I think I've always done. Like I've always been kind of like growing up, I was kind of a tomboy and I played with guys and I always got along with guys really, really well. And, you know, maybe that's a unique personality trait and that's why I am where I am. But gosh, we girl, the girls need to speak up. The girls, there's some powerful females in this profession. Um, and I'd love to see them have a bigger stage cause they're doing awesome things. Um, but they need to, we need to somehow find that confidence. And we, and I think as our male partnerships too, like we, we need you guys to really, you know, be like, you guys can do this and we need your, you know, your support. And, um, just like, that's going to help, I think, go far. And I hope to see that in the future. Yeah. Well, I, I hope every woman listening that ever goes to a conference <laughs> and sees a guy up on stage speaking and thinks, I know more than this dude, that is your sign that you need to apply and bug that person and get up on that stage the next year or the next time it's around. You're, yeah. you're right. There are so many women that have great information to present, but they just don't want to. So that's my little thing. It's about the speaking piece. Cause I think if you get up on stage, people recognize you. I mean, there's some great female chiros in our profession, you know, Christine Gertz, the researcher, you yeah. know, fantastic. You are the only chiropractor at a, and therefore the only female chiropractor at the UFC PI. And there's, there's a whole lot more. So I think it's, it's happening. Mm-hmm. I just, uh, I really want to see full equality for merit, not any other reason, you know, just who's Absolutely. the best get up on stage. Absolutely. So, and yeah. there was a, 
I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was a book I had just read, I think like last year and had a really cool, interesting study that had shown that if you had um, 10 females and 10 males who were like equal, you had equal qual- qualifications, but they weren't perfectly qualified for the job. I think only like four out of 10 females ap- would apply and nine out of 10 males would apply. And that was just like, wow, like, and, and honestly with this job, like the, with this UFC job, I almost didn't apply for this job. I thought never in a million years, there's no way this is getting across Dana's desk or whatever it was. Like, there's no way, even though I had every single qualification that they were asking for, like it made me stop and think. And, and I don't know why, you know, that is and where that comes from in our society, but we need to start being confident and pushing ourselves and getting out of that comfort zone. Cause, cause girls, you can be in sports. You can, you can get there. You can make it happen. You're just as good, if not better than a lot of guy docs that I've seen out there. So you know, I just want to say that. And if you're feeling unconfident, like come hang out with me, come learn. I'll push you. <laughs> and you got a couple of athletes around, female athletes around you that are, I mean, to stand across the uh, octagon from another woman whose sole intent is to take your head off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, your resume and her <laughs> resume might be dead set the same, but man, that confidence is going to serve you well in that situation. So. Yeah. And what's really cool about um, just randomly being in Vegas at the PI is we have, I think, four out of the top five flyweight uh, division women athletes there. So which is the 125 pound weight class. So I'm, we're, I'm literally daily working with the top five, you know, plus the champion and, you know, having all of these powerful women in they're badasses. So it's really cool to be um, in, you know, in the sport, seeing these women do what they do and wow, super cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Tara, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you and this is such an exciting story. Um, in it, I got to say, congratulations on landing your dream job. Uh, you know, some people go a full career and, and only think about what they missed and here you are, you're in it, you're doing it and, uh, you still got to work your ass off, but I'm sure that you go to bed tonight or bed every night and that, pillow feels mighty nice when you have worked your butt off doing exactly what you wanted to do, right? Yeah. You know, I'll say it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of luck to get here, but I, every day I'm pretty damn grateful and, and feeling pretty lucky. And I just want to kind of share it. So yeah, you know, guys reach out. Well, yeah. I would love to do another episode with you on, uh, because you know, the one thing we never covered is how did this job even open up? Like what's the backstory of the PI and, and how did this even create? Uh, Cause there are a lot of people that could have um, probably applied and filled that. So we'll have to get to that next time. Sound yeah, good? Yeah, love it. All right. Well, once again, how can people reach out to you if they either want to stop by or you got, you inspired a young female clinician who wants to, uh, wants to come shadow you and, and learn the, the ways of the powerful woman. <laughs> Um, so you can shoot me an email at, uh, T G I R O U X at UFC.com. That's my first initial and last name, or you can find me on Instagram at D R T E R a Dr. Tara and shoot me DM there. Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for the time today and, uh, man, very, I'm even more excited to watch every UFC now knowing that you helped, uh, get those people out there in the ring. So oh, thanks. Thanks for what you're doing. And thanks for the image that you're sharing with uh, the world about what chiropractic is capable of. It really does mean a lot to us. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. So on behalf of Dr. Tara Giroux, did I say it correctly that time? Yes, sir. All right, Dr. Tara Giroux. This is Dr. Josh Sadley saying, go out there, be like Tara and maximize your license so you can live the life you dream of. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for checking out these videos. I hope they're useful. We'll cover things like rehab, exercise, business model, progressions, layout, everything else that helps you build a clinic. So if you're interested, you can click here, there, here, here, or anywhere to get more videos just like this. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you soon.